This is Coons Ford Turp Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Good evening, Turp fans. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. This is Wayne Viner, and tonight I am joined by the young Terps. We have Jordan and Mason fresh in from their top 10 national podcasts, the number one listened to podcast on the Maryland Terrapins. Guys, how you doing tonight? Good. Yeah, doing great. Doing great. Well, it's, uh, I guess, a bittersweet day to be an Oriole fan. We're going to lead off with the Orioles. We're going to talk Maryland football. Of course, you have Dennis from Coons Ford going to come in and talk some Ravens, and then we'll see where we go in segment three. But I want to start with your Baltimore Orioles, Zach Britton. Mason, the latest Oriole to be traded, and gosh, it's to the Yankees, but I guess that's okay. Yeah, Zach Britton will now no longer be a closer as he moves to the Yankees, who already have a role as Chapman as their closer. Zach Britton set to take the setup man role there. But let's talk about what's new with the Orioles. Dylan Tate, the number one guy they got back, along with Cody Carroll and Josh Rogers. So you got a lot of pitching there. Uh, Jordan, what, what do you know about Dylan Tate? Well, he was the number four pick in 2016 at UC Santa Barbara, but he has not lived up to that billing so far in his career. No, he's been up and down with injuries and inconsistency. This year, he's been in double A out in Trenton, New Jersey. He started 15 times with a record of 5-2 and two and an ERA of 3.38. I mean, that doesn't sound too bad to me, but he was a number four pick. He was supposed to be... Really, coming out of college, he should have been in the MLB by now, two years out. Yeah, don't you think he's a little old for, yeah, for where he is right now? That is the main concern with him and why some people say that he's not the real big prize here. It's because he's 24 years old at this point. He's still in double A. In college, he had one good season that pushed him into being a great MLB prospect. But it's kind of shown that he really wasn't ready to be a number Top five pick. Well, with the Orioles' thin pitching lineup, do you think he could still end up being a starter on the O's? Boy, anybody could end up being a starter on the O's. Anybody except for Chris Tillman, who uh, left the team officially today. Uh, Cody Carroll was another pickup from the Yankees. Guys, what do you have on him? Well, Cody Carroll, I think, might end up being the best guy out of this group. He's 6'5", 215 pounds. He's a right-handed reliever at this point. He was picked 22nd out of Southern Mississippi. He was moved to Triple A this year and has just been great. He has nine saves with an ERA of 2.38, 55 strikeouts, and 18 walks over 41 innings this year. He's got a cooker at fastball, too, at 101 miles an hour. He's tracking a little bit of a bullpen guy, in my opinion. All right. I'm left-handed. I've pitched a baseball or two. So Josh Rogers... A uh, lefty, and you know, if you could throw a baseball and you're left-handed, you could get a career in uh, the major leagues that pays pretty well. He doesn't have the greatest record. Pitched 109 innings in Triple A. Uh, where'd the Yankees get him? Well, they got him in the 11th round of the draft out of Louisville in 2015. He's not a big name, but he does add value because he's a left-hander. Six and eight this year. He's going to be in the bullpen for the Orioles if he ever makes it to that level. Well, any pitching is good pitching at this point. Uh, the Orioles fought, fire sale looks to continue with Adam Jones on the block. Who else do you think could go? See, I don't know if that's fire sale. I think they're committed to this. I know you guys well, you got in, a nat and an O here. Go ahead, Mason. In the reports of the Dan Duquette press conference, he said the word rebuild, I believe it was around 20 times in 20 minutes. And he, they are committed to the rebuild. Adam Jones, of course, now on the block, but he can veto any trade. But in a recent press conference, he said that winning a World Series is now his goal. So where do you go from there? Is he now the guy that you're going to get the most for? Maybe. Would you trade Jonathan Scope? No. I think you got to keep one or two guys just to keep something to watch going. And Scope's that guy. He's a good defensive second baseman, but he can also hit the ball. you got to keep someone. Jordan, do you trade anybody at this point? I don't know. It's it's hard to say because in long-term success in mind, it doesn't help much to have a guy who's already in his mid to late 20s who's a moderately good second well, he's, baseman. he's good. I, I know he's talented, but I'm not sure if by the time the team is ready to compete in the playoffs again, he's going to be worth anything. 
So from a long-term perspective, you should trade him, but also I agree with Mason that you can't just bottom out completely and have Anyone, nothing. Well, of course, but Anyone. that you already have. Anyone can go for the right price. That's all. <laughs> That's where I'll leave it. Other guys that are on the hot boards right now for trades, Michael Givens, who the Orioles have locked in until 2021, is looking for a move to the Pirates, whose 11-game win streak ended today. Hey, um, like I said, anyone, well, anyone should be able to go, I think. And they are also looking to shop Brad Brock, who is locked down until 2022. And, of course, all this needs to happen in the next couple of days as the deadline's coming up. Yep, yeah, so if you're going to get trading, it's, it's time to do it. At this point, I don't know how you can be much worse. Well, and that's, to me, the shame of it is that this team has bottomed out. And you said they're tracking. Well, you told me in the beginning of June, the, as a joke, are the Orioles' worst team in history as a topic for the show. Now it is actually mathematically very plausible, according to Bleacher Report, for them to be the worst team in history. They could top the 120 loss mark. They're currently tracking for 116. I just, I've seen it and I can't believe it. And I know Bruce goes to all the games and he can't really believe it. It is quite literally unbelievably bad. So let's go from the unbelievably bad to the promising, which is Maryland football starts off. They kick off at noon against Texas. How many days from now, Jordan? 39 days. Well, 38 because it's past noon today. Okay, 38 days. Okay, Mason's counting the seconds down because we are fired up. Texas going to roll in here to FedEx Field, not necessarily a home game. Hopefully we'll sell a lot of tickets being a, from the Terp perspective, and hopefully they don't sell them all to Texas fans. Hopefully, but for once I believe that we are not the only ones that are excited about this. Well, Texas is inching for some revenge after last year. It was a great game, in my opinion, last year, but it was uh, they were they were not happy about that loss. Well, I want to take a look back before we go forward. Oh, I watched it the other day. There's a 30 minute version on YouTube <laughs> for anyone that wants to see it of the Texas Maryland highlights. No, no, it's a full game in 30 minutes. Yeah, they do this thing where they cut out all the ad breaks in between plays and stuff, so you can watch the whole game in 30 minutes. Okay, and maybe I'll take a look at that. It it was. Absolutely scintillating, amazing, fantastic to be there. We finally, I thought, had our signature win, and we were on the way. And from the hits we had on the website and the postgame videos and the whole thing, our, the numbers spiked. Everybody was football crazy. And then we find out that Piggy blew out his knee, which we sort of knew from watching the game. Kasim Hill lasts another game or so, blows out his knee. And in typical Maryland fashion, season sort of ended right there. What do you think would have happened quickly if we didn't lose every quarterback who could play? Between six and six and eight and four. Originally, my prediction was eight and four, and it was plausible. Don Marcus from the Sun was saying there's a chance to go eight and four, but you really just don't know what happens because the whole team seemed to drop out at a certain point. They did. They put in Borton Schlager. They had that nice <laughs> win at Minnesota, and you said maybe there's something here and. Well, there, there really wasn't. Well, I think the US, the UCF loss really derailed us, which was it shouldn't have much respect. That was a really good team. We just didn't know that at the time, but it was really demoralizing for us. I don't think we ever really recovered from that one. Yeah, UCF was fantastic. Uh, co-national champion to you? No, not to me, but to Jordan, yes. For me, there was still a chance that if Kasim stays up in that game, that Maryland pushes or possibly wins. At that point in the season, I don't really think UCF was the same team they were at the end. Well, teams do grow. Some teams even get better. You are listening to Coons Ford Presents Terp Talk this Wednesday and every Wednesday here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio in Baltimore. I'm Wayne Viner, along with intern Mason and Jordan down at the other end. Bruce is away from the microphone. So we have looked up and down for some Texas notes. What do you have for the Texas team, and how are they looking at the wonder coach that they got? Tom Herman was supposed to be the greatest coach on the planet when they hired him. Well, there have been mixed reviews from recruits on Tom Herman, as there are for almost any coach. Some people have said that he's a little bit fraudulent with the recruits. Other people seem to love him beyond belief. But when you're looking at Texas football right now, they're still seemingly confused from the media side on really getting a handle on what's going to happen confused that they expect to be great or they don't know or they just they don't know who's gonna play they seem to be just uncertain of what games they're gonna win or if they'll pick it up at the end of the year or really just what to look for well how did they do after maryland uh 
beat them on the opening day of last season? Well, it was kind of a roller coaster ride as Shane Bouchel did go down the starting quarterback for Texas. Then they went to Sam Ellingar, who was a super freshman. They won, they lost, they ended the year with a bowl game win over Missouri in the Texas Bowl. And that was a bizarre bowl game for me because Missouri belongs in Texas's conference, so it felt like a conference game, sort of. They had a mixed bag of a year, but it definitely, they seemed positive at the end. They seemed happy with how they closed out the season. All right. Todd well, Orlando on the defensive side. Great coordinator. But he loses a lot going into this year. Malik Jefferson, Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, defensive tackle Pona Ford, defensive lineman of the year in the Big 12, and safety Deshaun Elliott, who was a throat Thorpe award, award. Yeah. finalist. Yep. As, so. as one of the best defensive backs out there. And with all those guys on the field, Maryland jumped them early. Um, they really have gone out and recruited well, although when you have recruits, they're all freshmen and sophomores in the defensive back. I heard they picked up some serious talent for the Texas Longhorns. Yeah, Caden Stern, who is the number three safety prospect in the country, will be on the field this year for the Longhorns, along with B.J. Foster. Both of those guys did get in for the spring. They're early enrollees. They also picked up the number six safety prospect in the country. Uh, that, I think, is uh, DeMarvian... Uh, Overshone. What's Overshone, yeah. Uh, he gets one of the names of the year. There, yeah. Not too many guys named DeMarvian out there. Okay, so those are all freshmen, and they lost some guys, so we don't even know who's going to be on the field for these Texas Longhorns. No, but the thing that I would like to point out is Todd Orlando had a great year in 2017, got him a pay raise from $1.1 to $1.7 million, and they only gave up 21.2 points per game in the Big 12. Okay, so you think the Big 12 overall is a bit specious when it comes to what Defense. a good score. Yeah. So, yeah, that was an impressive number. They also held four— it's, it's impressive because everybody scores 50 points in every yeah. game. well, that's kind of a given now. That's been like that for years, despite people like me very much disliking it, almost finding it unwatchable. Jordan, do you think that up-and-down basketball style of football that they play down there in Texas is good or bad for the game? It's indifferent. It's not widespread enough to make a difference, in my opinion. The whole conference is like that. Yeah, it's one it's, conference, and honestly, it's proven to show that they don't win the big games. That's not proven. What well, you mean do the you conference have? doesn't win the big games? The conference doesn't win the big games, and also they're regarded by the playoff committee at this point as sub below the SEC in the Big Ten. Yeah. No. Yes. Well, no. TCU yes. and Baylor. Example one, two, three, No, that three, was because they didn't have... That's two examples, Mason. You can't count that as more than two teams. Yes, you can. Because they're you, both... They were, what were they? 11-1 and one or 12-1? and one he's, and, he's borrowing Bruce's calculator. He's, whatever number he comes up with, that's the number you get. I think that they're... <laughs> That they don't get the respect when you look at, at the draft board and the NFL side of yeah, things. Yeah, on the NFL side of things, but then Baker Mayfield goes number one. They can and you'll find to... out what a mistake that is any minute. I don't think that. You think he's really good? I don't think he's really good, but I don't really he's think... He's the number one pick I, in the whole I league. I do not think that many ah. other people, quarterbacks in the draft, Sam Darnold, kind of the same story, Josh Rosen, sometimes I don't think he likes playing football, so looking at other people... Baker maybe not be a horrible pick because they need a quarterback. Okay, okay. We, we, we can rationalize anything we want to rationalize. But my point is, Oklahoma made it to the playoff. And they lost. And they lost in like one of the greatest games I've ever seen. Oh, I don't remember. Who'd they play? Georgia. In the Rose Bowl? Oh, yeah, that was the one of the greatest. <laughs> you're right. That's one of the greatest games I've ever seen. So that's enough Texas talk, well, or is it? Well, we haven't really addressed the main story from Texas at this point, which is that they have a four-way quarterback battle between Sam Ellinger, who stepped in for Shane Bouchel, Shane Bouchel, and two four-star quarterbacks that they brought in, Cameron Rising and Casey Thompson. Excuse me, his name is Cameron Rising? Yes, his name is Cameron Rising. They have... Uh, what was the other name? Demarion Overshone and Cameron Rising on the same team. They're getting good here. But on, also on the offensive side of the ball, they returned Colin Johnson and Jordan Humphrey. But they lost the guy who really lit up Maryland, which was Reggie Hemphill Maps. That guy could move it. He was one heck of a returner. They have a Maryland-like backfield coming in with Tonell Carter. The names just keep coming. Keontre Ingram. And they also picked up a transfer from Cal, Trey Watson. Hey, Maryland picked up a transfer named Trey Watson. Exactly. Yes, they did. From Illinois. 
But the, what this all says to me is they're unproven. They don't know what's going on. Well, neither we don't exactly know what's going on either. For for Maryland or for Texas? Neither of them do. We don't know who's playing quarterback. We don't know who's playing running back. I mean, we know Ty Johnson's going to start. But we don't know anything else. We don't know any re- who the receivers are. I mean, we don't know much either, I don't think. I know, but we're not Texas. And Texas, one of the great things about Texas, and then we'll end this Texas football segment here, is that if you ask them, they are one of the premier organizations. They deserve to be a top 10 team. Football's in their blood. And when you go out there and actually go to a game there, you can sort of buy into that. Yeah, yeah. especially when they're losing and they're going absolutely crazy. Right. So that was a lot of fun. All right. So we got a couple minutes before we go to the break. Give me your take on the first couple of games for Maryland football. In segment three of the show, we're going to break down who's actually been on the field for Maryland. Well, I'll start. I see Texas as a win. And actually, some people, unlike last year, are seeing Maryland to beat Texas. So that gives me another vote of confidence. The Terps just come out with the rushing attack that an uncertain Texas defense can't handle. Okay, so you got Texas, you got Bowling Green. Bowling Green's another win. All right. Uh, Temple. Temple, and then you have one early game, which is Minnesota comes to Capital One Field at Bird Stadium at Maryland, Maryland Stadium. Stadium. Thank you. So out of those four, and we'll just deal with those four, you can't really see past that because of the injuries. 4-0. Four 3-1, 4-0? And four and oh? four and oh. Mason says 4-0. Oh. Jordan? 3-1. and one. I'll take a floating loss. We're not going to beat everybody. Not good. Okay. I, I, for Maryland, for once, the Texas game, huge. I think you could go 4-0. and oh. That doesn't mean you're going to beat Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan, Michigan State, Illinois. Who am I leaving out already? Indiana. Yeah, Jordan and I were talking about this on the podcast, and they can get to a point where, what was it, like they're 8-2? and two? They can be 8-2 and two and then lose to Ohio State and Penn State and be 8-4. and four. So 8-2, and two, Maryland, Ohio State, would that be a big game when Maryland really hasn't beaten anyone? No. You have to beat somebody first, and that, that becomes an issue. One of the problems, I know the roster's been decimated. I know there's a lot of turnover. This is year three for DJ? Yep. Yep. You got to beat somebody. Sooner or later, however you do it, wherever you get the players, however the ball bounces, you got to win a game. You cannot continue to have a uh, six and seven the first year. Last year was a four win campaign. Yeah, four and eight. You got to do better. Six and six might put some people in the stands, but at some point, you got to win. Usually, it's year three or four when these guys start to win if you're going to turn it around. Do you see this as possibly better than 6-6, six and six, Jordan? Oh, it's absolutely possible. I don't know if it's likely. It all depends if we can keep Kasim or Piggy upright. Mason, is this the year? A couple breakthroughs? It's not, it's not the year. The schedule would dictate it to be better than other years, but I can't see this being the year. That's definitely going to be next year for me. So next year's your make or break year. I don't think it's make or break. I think they're going to solidify themselves as a team that can show that they can win eight or nine this year. Okay. Ke- Kevin Anderson gave DJ Durkin a contract for how long? When five or five. six. I think, it, I think it was. So we're looking at an extension after this year. And that's why this is such a big deal. You're going to have to come out and extend him if you want him to recruit. Maryland football recruiting not doing as well as in the past two seasons. And we'll pick up on that a little bit with Dennis. We will be back. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Good evening, Terp fans. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. This is Wayne Viner along with the Young Terps. You have Mason and Jordan from the Young Terps podcast, the number one listen to Maryland sports podcast in the nation. On the phone right now is Dennis Kulatsis from Coons Ford. Dennis, welcome in this evening. Well, we'll pick up Dennis here in a moment. Uh, we were going through a couple of the possible game outcomes for uh, Maryland football when we last uh, were on the air a few minutes ago and promised to get into the depth chart. So while we're waiting to find Dennis, why don't we talk about your highest impact Maryland Terrapins for this season? Well, on the offensive side of the ball, i got to say highest impact, I'm going to go with Kasim Hill. That's a good choice. Uh, you're going to need a quarterback. Somebody's got to play. You think Kasim's the clear starter over Peggy? Well, I think I think it's a pretty even competition, but I, I think it's a bit cheating to give a quarterback. I'm going to say it's Ty Johnson. I think he needs to help whoever's behind center really step up. Well, now, you mentioned the new offensive coordinator. 
which is Matt Canada. And he's going to bring some things to Maryland football that are going to change the balance of the offense. But Ty Johnson was on this team last year, and they just couldn't run an offense with just Ty Johnson. Is it the offensive line? Is it Ty Johnson or the quarterback, guys? Because I think Maryland has the third most experienced offensive line out there. Well, experience doesn't necessarily mean good, and I think the offensive line really struggled to keep the runners clean last year. Yeah, they did. Yeah. But I, you you also got to look at some of the quarterback plays, especially not to really trash him, but when Bordy took over. There were plays, and I always look at that one from the Indiana game where they gave up the safety. Okay. Why the quarterback, I don't know if really this was an option either, doesn't change some of these Calls plays. at the line. Yeah. I don't think that he felt that he had the power to, to override the offensive coordinator, Walt Bell, who now is at Florida State. You guys have really liked this Matt Canada setup. What, what about Matt Canada makes him a quality coordinator for the Maryland Terrapins? Well, Maryland seemingly at this point needs a guy to step in and say, this is what we're doing on offense, and here's how we're going to do it. Matt Canada is known to be one of those guys and really just will give Maryland a certain offensive well, force. Is that the, look a more powerful, run-oriented, Big Ten-style attack? I think so. You look at his past two backs, Darius Geis and Leonard Fournette, and you just see what he can do with great running back talent. Well, Maryland has some great running back talent, and somebody who is going to go out and rate these guys as a draft class sooner or later, these Maryland running backs, is Dennis Gulatsis. Dennis? Hey, Wayne. Hey, thanks for joining in. Maryland has some, what we hope is premier talent in the offensive backfield with Ty Johnson. Uh, they have Lolo Harrison. They have uh, Anthony McFarland, Jake Funk. The list goes on. Do you see down the road any of these guys being an NFL impact? Yeah, you know, Maryland has always produced uh, a good number of uh, players at the skill position. So the scouts will be out there, I'm sure, all season long. I mean, they, they do have a reputation for developing offensive talent, whether it's you know, Stephon Diggs or some of the other great players that, I'm out of the, that have come out of that program. But I heard you guys talking about the offensive line. They'll, they'll go as the offensive line goes. If they can open up those holes and uh, keep the quarterbacks upright, uh, it'll certainly benefit the running game. Well, they have two tackles who were rated very highly on the sort of the pro football rating system when they applied that to the Big Ten. Derwin Gray and... Damian Prince. Both rated very highly and graded out very well, so it must be the middle of the line. This year, the center, which is uh, more, is rated as a Remington Award listed center already. Wow. The fellow behind him, Johnny Jordan, very highly thought of at center. We might see, Mason, a way to get both of those guys on the field just to up the overall star positions across that line. How does that look to you? Yeah, well, that would give you the look of in the middle, you would play Terrence Davis. He's your stronghold at right guard. And then you would switch to Johnny Jordan at center and move to Brendan Moore at the left guard instead of Sean Christie. And that gives you five highly rated players on the field at one time. You hope they play well on offense. But since you're our Ravens expert, Mason, what do you have on the Ravens tonight for Dennis? Well, Dennis, camp has kicked off out in Owings Mills. How's it looking for the Ravens through these first couple of days? Well, I think it's, uh, the, you know, the entire team is optimistic. Uh, lots of uh, talent and influx of talent. The, uh, this year's draft class, Mason, they're bigger than what they've drafted in the, pa- in the past, so they just look like bigger, sturdier, more stout players. That's the first. The optics are very good uh, for the rookie draft class, plus the, the three new wide receivers, the two rookie tight ends. Lamar Jackson is definitely delighted the, the entire camp, not just the offense, but the defense. The guy is a highlight reel, and Joe Flacco seems to be very highly motivated. So to me, it's going to go right down before we're talking about the Terps football. The offensive line. The offensive line has got to be stout. They've got to get some competition there at center and, and at left guard and the right tackle. So they'll go as the offensive line goes. Again, they have three real good running backs. But that running game's got to make – it's got to click. Uh, or, you know, Joe Flacco can't be in second and ten, third and ten situations. Or he'll struggle again. I don't care who the wide receivers are. But uh, great cause for optimism and – I, look, I, I think I see a way they can go 10-6, and six, and I think they need to go 10-6 and six in order for things not to change around the castle. Well, 
Lamar Jackson's really taken almost all the spotlight as far as the Ravens training camp goes, but the other first-round draft pick, Hayden Hurst, has been showered with praise by both quarterbacks. Do you see anything special in him? Well, Hayden Hurst, he's been out for, he missed a couple of practices because he had some calluses on his feet, some uh, or the, the sort of t- soft tissue injury of some type, but uh, when he's been on the field, he's made a difference, and look, he has good rapport and communication with both of quarterbacks, but uh, we're all rooting for Joe Flacco to have a great year, but it's hard to see Joe Flacco, no matter what he does, coming back in 2019 as the Ravens' starting quarterback. They did draft Lamar Jackson uh, to sit him out you know, his first couple of years of play. So very intriguing. It doesn't matter. Even if, if the wheels fall off the cart this year, we'll see Lamar Jackson in there. So the Ravens are going to be a great team to watch no matter what happens. And that's, that's the, the fascinating part of them drafting a quarterback in the first round. Dennis, Jimmy Smith looking at a four-game suspension now, along with that Achilles injury. Who's going to have to step up and make the big plays for them to be successful in the defensive backfield? Well, thank goodness they have uh, Marlon Humphrey, the second-year pro out of Alabama. He's a, a year bigger, faster, stronger, smarter. He's, he's, uh, now he, he's really improved uh, since last year. where He was one of the top-rated rookies, quarterbacks in a very, very stout cornerback class. You have Cave Young, Cave Young Young coming back as your nickel corner that will help the secondary. Plus, Derek Carr, the other corner, never misses any games, a, 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 a wildly crafty veteran. So I think they'll be able to hold up well on a back end with Jimmy Smith's absence. Jimmy Smith's cap number, on top of my head, I believe it's $19 million next year. So yeah, he's one of the highest. Have, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was going to say yeah, he's the second have, highest paid corner in the league. Really? Yeah, I mean, they're, yeah, they're going to have a decision to make with him, whether it's restructuring or cutting him. Because with his list rank injuries, you know, the, the soft tension injuries he suffered in the last several years, uh, I don't know that they can continue to move forward with Jimmy Smith. But the, the good news for the Ravens, they're very deep at cornerback. Anthony Everett, the fourth-round draft pick from Alabama, in 2016, he started opposite of Marlon Humphrey. So they, they have a, a ton of talent on that back end. They can't withstand for Jimmy Smith to miss a few games this year, which we we predict it anyway based on his past history. All right. Uh, my overall question is, does Eric Weddle still have the best beer in the NFL? <laughs> he's, got the best qu- he's got the best beer in the NFL, and he also disclosed he played last year with a, with a separated shoulder injury, which I knew, which that was the reason why I missed the tackle um, on the, the, uh, the Chicago Bears uh, uh, running back, Howard, uh, on that uh, overtime game, but uh, hopefully that besides the beer, Weddle is healthy this year. It could really make an impact uh, for the Ravens in that safety position. Dennis, we're hearing about this kicker punter. I believe his name is pronounced Kare Vedvik. I don't. That is correct. And he hit a 66 yarder yesterday in practice. And I'm hearing some chatter of Justin Tucker possibly on his way out for maybe a draft pick. Uh, it's hard to imagine that uh, they're, they're going to trade the. Uh, not just uh, one of the, the NFL's most accurate kick, uh, kicker in, in their entire history, but also a, a you know, good guy. He's involved in the community. He had a lot of friends on the team. It's just not about the, this, this rookie kicker, free agent kick in the 66 yard field goal. I mean, it's one thing to do it in practice, but uh, Tucker and, and Sam Cook and their long snapper, they're, they're, they're joined at the hip. I mean, you're talking about the Wolf Pack, so it's, it's, it's a lot more than just hitting a 66 yarder in practice, so I think that's much ado about nothing. My opinion, anything could happen, of course, but I can't see them parting company. I think Justin Tucker will retire a Raven, and he will hold all of the NFL records at that point. Well, one of the um, steals of the draft, in my opinion, was Orlando Brown, who was projected as a first-round t- offensive tackle and then had a horrible, horrible combine, sending him to the third round to the Ravens. Mm-hmm. Do you see him getting on the field his first season? Uh Mason, he's got to get stronger. Uh, you know, he just doesn't have the explosiveness that you'd like to see in an offensive uh, player. And he also came out of that spread offense at Oklahoma. He was never in a three-point stance. He was always coming out of a two-point stance. He's got to prove that he can fire off the ball with his hand in the dirt. Okay, <laughs> okay so Dennis, you got Mason yeah. raising his hands in triumph because he thinks that those offenses, Texas, Oklahoma, et cetera, don't prepare anybody for the NFL. Is that true, Mason? Of course it is. That that's one of my holds here that I will yeah. never move off of that. What and that hold is that the Big Twelve does not produce NFL talent and they do not play old fashioned football that translates to the NFL. Uh, and Mr. Draft Expert, do you buy into that? Yeah, I think Mason's hundred percent spot on. 
I like players that come out of pro-style offenses, pro-style defenses. You know, Carson Wentz is a perfect example of that. Lamar Jackson came out of a pro-style offense. I think it makes the transition to the NFL a lot better, a lot easier, and they have a better chance of success. Whereas with when you're drafting out of the you know the offenses that uh, Mason uh, talked about, you're really rolling the dice because it's not a guarantee, and that's the reason why Orlando Brown lasts until the third round. You know, they're taking a shot based on legacy, his father, and game film, but. Look, it's 50 50 at this point. Maybe 40 60 against that he's mm. going to make it. And we're all rooting for him, but there's a reason why uh, he got drafted so okay. late by the Ravens. So I wouldn't uh, call him a steal just yet. Dennis brought up the name Carson Wentz. Jordan, you spend nine months of the year in Fargo, North Dakota. What does Fargo, North Dakota, and the NDSU fans think of Carson Wentz at the moment and, and his Eagles? He's the Messiah to them. He, he's, the, he's proof that. You can make it in the FCS, which is something that keeps needing to be proven for some reason, despite the fact that you know Joe Flacco came out of the FCS, Tarek Cohen last year for the Bears, but he's proof that the FCS can produce superstar quarterbacks. And some of the best games and best tailgates I've ever been to have been at North Dakota State. And those guys in North Dakota like trucks. And one thing you have that I have not seen in another Ford dealer, not that I'm going to other Ford dealers, but I haven't seen another Ford dealer, are these no-limit pickup trucks. And even though I'm not a pickup truck guy, I look at these things, Dennis, and go, oh, my God, they're unbelievable vehicles. How did you yeah. get into selling no-limit pickup trucks? Uh, Wayne, you, you would look good in one. In fact, the, the, the reason why we got to selling uh, no-limit trucks was we had some uh, NFL players from the Ravens came up, and they, they knew some guys at No Limit and said, hey, we want to buy these trucks and we want you to outfit them. And that's how we kind of accidentally backed into Upsetting these trucks with uh, through no limit, and they, they get a factory warranty. All the lifts are factory approved, so there's never any warranty problems. And uh, we sold two of them, five and ten and twenty, and now we're selling about thirty-five, forty no limit trucks a month. Well, if you guys, anybody listening to this, likes pickup trucks and you want something that nobody else has, you got to go see Dennis and you got to go take a look at these trucks. We went out looking at Mustangs a few weeks ago, and the I think it's called a Kelderman King Ranch or something like that. Really big truck. Immediately just catches your eye, even if you're not looking for it, because it is something different. Mason, what do you got? Well, Dennis, you seem to have a few of one of my favorites in stock, and that is the Ford Focus ST. They changed it up for 2018, changed where those exhaust tips are, and the back of the car is just beautiful. Yeah, it's it's a great-looking vehicle, a great handling vehicle, and I'm sure that you and and your dad would appreciate it. We just got uh, in uh, yesterday a uh, 2019 Ford Mustang Bullet, you know, the, uh, the iconic car that Steve McQueen uh, drove. It's that, that, that dark metallic green on my showroom floor. It's a, it's a beautiful car. I encourage you guys to come out and take a look at it. And we will. Uh, it's, it's always great talking football with Dennis. Thank you for being on. And for all you Ravens fans, In the Nest is coming back soon. And Mason along with Bruce, and Dennis is going to do something special. Hopefully we get that up next week. What is that, Mason? Well, furthering into the podcast enterprise, we go with the In the Nest podcast that will be starting next week, featuring Dennis and Bruce and myself, and that should be coming out at a unreleased time next week. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that next week, and uh, we'll be talking about Ray Lewis going in the Hall of Fame. Dennis, thanks for being on. You are listening to... Coons Ford Terp Talk this Wednesday and every Wednesday here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio. We'll be back after this break talking more Maryland football. This is Coons Ford Terp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. Bruce is away from the microphone this evening. This is Wayne Viner in with the Young Terps here on Terp Talk. And we are talking Maryland football as we get ready for the 2018 kickoff game with Texas. Uh, Before we were speaking with Dennis and mentioned some of the offensive stars, I want to pick up on two things on the offense. One is, do we have any idea who the wide receivers are going to be, Mason? Well, we were thinking about this, and we created a list of the guys who you will certainly see out there this year. Our number one currently sits at Tavon Jacobs. Number two, the man that will be taking on the number one jersey for the Turf football team, DJ Turner. And the third guy that you'll be most certainly seeing this year is Jarvis Davenport. All right. Those are some more senior veteran members of the team. Jordan, you have anybody to add to that? Well, kind of after that, you fall off a cliff. 
And I'm not saying in terms of talent, it's just that you kind of fall into the unknown. You have six freshman receivers, and you we really don't know who any of them are going to be playing. And I will take uh, you on take you up on that that we really don't know who's going to play. Uh, you both of you mentioned the tight end's going to be back in the scheme because of the way Matt Canada runs an offense. How many catches the tight ends have last year? It was zero. I think it was th- bingo. It's zero. Mason wins zero. But well, the year before, it was 12, so we, we can't say that Avery Edwards has never gotten the ball. Well, Avery Edwards has been really good when he's seen him play, I think. When he's played as a receiver, I think he's been good when he's been the extra blocking lineman. I, I don't see where that works. Uh, there are some freshmen who are probably going to get on the field in the tight end ranks, and that sort of wraps up. We did a little offensive line. We talked about Kasim Hill and Piggy. Talked about the running backs, receivers, so we're going to move over to the special teams before we get to the defense. A uh, young man by the last name of Petrino is going to wear the number 27 jersey. He's a kicker. Mason, what do you know about him? Well, Joseph Petrino, definitely something special. Can kick, what was it, 50 and 60 yards with the right and the left? Well, famously, yes, he can kick with both legs. And I don't know how we're going to use that. I hope we can figure out how, though. And this week, a September 1st Where You At video from Joseph Petrino showed him nailing one off of the Y in Maryland that's spelled across the field. And you put that up on Turp Talk? Yes, it is up on Turp Talk if you want to give it a look. It is 60, that's a 60 yard field goal for those who are keeping the score. We need somebody who can kick the football. Our punter, Wade Lee, is the Australian. I believe he's 27 years old. He, no, no, no. He's coming out on his 30th birthday, will be during the season. Really? 30? Wow. Yeah. He, that's every Maryland college student's dream to be there till you're 30. He gets to live that out. Um, but he is on the Ray Guy list for best punters in America, so we'll see how that goes. And the long snappings and great hands with Oliveira, who is in his senior season. Yeah, now in his senior year. As a Maryland long snapper. Well, real quick before we leave the special teams, this has been a spot, especially last year, with both Lees and Adam Green, who kicked last year. It was a really, it was a real struggle. And... You have to have good special teams to win football games, especially when your offense isn't necessarily moving the ball. Okay, well, we hope the offense moves the ball a little bit, but I want to go over to what's been a weak spot for a while in the Durkin regime, and that is being able to stop the run. I want to start with a defensive line back for his fifth year, uh, redshirt senior at rush end, or as you call him, the buck, number six, Jesse Anybottom. Yeah, Maryland's going to need Jesse Anybottom to be big, this year, they needed him last year, but unfortunately, after that Texas game where he played so well, he went down. Well, that was a very underrated, in my opinion, uh, injury to last year was Jesse Anibum getting hurt and really derailing any pass rush he might have had. See, I think if that was at any other point in the season, it would have been a big injury. But since Piggy went down the same game, it kind of got lost in the news cycle. Anibum was huge. Didn't really have a rush end after that. They played Bryce Brand, a freshman. Bryce Brand... I think is going to get back on that field this year. It gives you a one-two punch at the rush end. The, the, the thing about Bryce Brand is he's a little short, but he does have a lot of power. So if he does get up out there... It, okay, so we'll see. I mean, it's still a we'll see at nose tackle. You have actually some depth here, led by uh, Adam McLean, Brayon Gaddy, who is probably... One of the two Gaddies is going to get on the field. And a guy that's had knee injuries but has a tremendous talent, still hasn't played for Maryland, Cam Spence. What do you make of those guys? Yeah, it's a good group, but a lot of unproven guys out there. MB Tanya mm-hmm. and Key Ryan Howard, definitely the guys with the most experience. But I kind of see them as the guys who are going to play the least if some of these three, four, and five-star guys even get out there on the field. So MB Tanya, Oluwatami. Osei Sane. They'll get their chance, but I think they're... Key Ryan of, Howard. You almost want them to be somewhat out of the picture. Because mm-hmm. you've brought in all this talent over years now. Right. They've gotten their redshirt year. Some of them have gotten their freshman year over with now. It's time for them to play. Okay, I, I go with that. But when you talk about a guy like Brayon Gaddy, a four-star recruit, was committed to Tennessee, ends up at Maryland. He's up to about 360 pounds now. He can anchor, we hope, a middle. Let's can, talk about what I think is a defensive superstar. Byron Cowart, you guys looked into him when he was at Auburn. Jordan, what do you have? Well, we don't know what we have. He's He played a little bit at Auburn, but he never really showed superstar stuff. He was the number one recruit in the country by ESPN in whatever 2014 class, I think it was. He There's definitely the superstar potential, but we need 
to be able to, he needs to show it at this point. He's going to be a junior. He needs to show that he can live up to his pedigree. Well, I've talked about this before when Maryland first got him. He comes to Auburn and they change his position. And for some defensive linemen, that is a big thing. There are some guys who can play every position on the field. There are some guys that are very specialized at one. The anchor is Byron Cowart's specialty. Well, so they're putting him back in the position that he was that number one recruit for. So hopefully they'll get a lot out of it. Did you go to the practice the day that, yes, that we talked yeah. to him? And he talked at length, and we have that up on Terp Talk on the video section, about how what happened to him changed his focus. He didn't realize what he had. And it was a classic redemption story of somebody who seemed to me, got a little puffed up being the number one guy. Some people are the number three, but it was between the number one and number three player in America. He went to Auburn, which is a football godsend down there, and it didn't happen. And now he's got a chance to make it. And I think because of that, I think you're going to see one heck of an effort out of him. If it doesn't happen for Cowart, right behind him is Brandon Gaddy who is at 311 pounds. His brother's 326. Brandon's going to be the backup strong sider anchor. And also over there, a guy that I was impressed with in practice is Lautez Rogers. Your guy, Brett Kulk, is over there. And Bamad Miller also over there. So from a team that had maybe four guys who could play defensive line, we just threw out 10 names of guys who can actually, I think, play this year. Well, you don't know that yet. There's always going to be. A, I think they can play. Okay, yes, you think they can they can play, but there will always be a thinning, especially on the lines. Okay, and linebacker quickly. A uh, Trey Watson comes in from Illinois. He's got a lot of experience over there. Isaiah Davis still in there, and then you have your pass coverage guy Antoine Brooks, who's just an amazing athlete and defensive. My player. concern at linebacker is really out of the guys we mentioned. Uh, man, I can't remember who it was. Now, the second guy who you mentioned was Isaiah only, Davis. Isaiah Davis is the only one who actually we know, we know for a fact, can really play inside linebacker. Oh, Trey That's Watson, true. Point. Trey Watson led Illinois, a Big Ten team. And they also picked up Wyatt Cook, who transfers from Purdue. So he'll be in at linebacker. And a guy that I really like, uh, whose name, uh, Mosley, Jordan Mosley, yeah, is going to be Mosley. a big. Uh, you've got about two minutes. I'm going to throw this to Mason, do a little bit of defensive back. Well, at defensive back for the Terps, you will be seeing a lot of transfers this year. Marcus Lewis will most likely take over the number one spot, the Florida State transfer, along with Rayshad Lewis, who came to the Terps as a wide receiver, now moved to defensive back. And on the opposite side, Tino Ellis. Moving to the back, free safety is one of the few lock positions on this roster with Darnell Savage. And strong safety, Quantrez Knight or Antoine Richardson, one of those guys is going to have to step up big. All right. I'm hoping maybe a Deion Jones, a Fozy, uh, Fofi Bazzi, or somebody that else that's been on this team, a Rayvon Davis, makes a good impression back there. Overall look for the Terps. we got about a minute here. Overall, better or worse than last year with talent? Better. better. Got two batters. Better or worse on the record this year? Better. Man. Four and eight, Jordan. Four and six and, I give him six and six. Which is better. I, I would love a six and six. We've got to move this forward. Maryland football has a chance to step up. Impressions of new Cole Fieldhouse, the practice facility. You've been there a couple times. It's really expensive for what we got so far, in my opinion. I'll agree with that. But it's really nice. It, it is re- really nice. But it costs a fortune. Well, real estate and building and stuff at Maryland just costs more in the city than you get other places. It's been one of the holdbacks when you look into Nebraska or somebody's out in the middle of nowhere. When we do a building in town playing city rates, it costs money. But they jacked up the price two times by making it coal field house. I don't know if you had to do that or not. There's a couple of things I don't know if you had to do, but they did it, I think, with the new athletic director... Our- are we seeing that new tunnel? The tunnel's half built. So we'll see if we actually get to use it this year, but the street's gone, and everybody goes out to see a game at Maryland Stadium will will notice that. I would like to thank Bruce for giving us the opportunity to come in this Wednesday. Thanks to Jordan and Mason, the Young Terps, for joining us. And, of course, thanks to Dennis Galatzis for being on the air and for the sponsorship for Coons Ford. We will be back on Saturday morning with the Sports Maven here on 1300 CBS Sports Radio in Baltimore. Good evening.